on BET. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tip T.I. Harris. I thought they had a more sophisticated <laughs> way to get this up we here. Got no, we got no sophistication here. I would have brought it myself. What's Clifford going on? Harris Jr. Yes, sir. is your given name, your government name, as we like to say. Yeah. Give us a little bit about who you were growing up. Uh, I was a young man who grew up on the west side of Atlanta and, you know, in one of the many underserved areas of society uh, to a a single mother and a grandmother and grandfather. and I knew my father. My father, he lived in New York, but I was on Bankhead. You know what I loved? I told you I watched the Netflix uh, story on you. For those right of you on. who haven't seen it and you want some insight that you may not be able to get fully with today's discussion because we're going to emphasize business heavily, there's a Netflix series called Rapture and he's on it. And you talk about when you were five or in the fifth grade where you bought candy yeah. and then sold it. So there was an entrepreneurial spirit from you from the beginning. Talk, talk to me about that. Um, yeah, well, I think like most entrepreneurs, my, 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 the spirit for, for, for me operating my own business derived from a dire need of extra resources. You know what I'm saying? I lived with my mother. Who, who, you know, was public assistance, uh, Section 8, welfare, food stamps, so on and so forth, and my grandparents. But when I went to see my father, who lived on the, you know, the, the uh, what is it, Upper Manhattan, 94th and Columbus in New York City, we had all our needs met, everything. I had too much of anything to use between June and August. So when I go back home, I'm going back, you know, to the projects. Uh, and... He'd always give me some, and the first thing my father taught me when I was young is, you know, a man always keep money in his pocket, and you always take care of, of your family. So every time I'd see him, well, first of all, he'd give me a dollar a day throughout the summer. You know, he was a number runner and a hustler, but I never knew what he did. I just knew he got up in the morning and left and came back and talked on the phone and counted money. That's all I knew he did. <laughs> So he'd give me a dollar a day, a dollar a day, a dollar a day. And, um, and, and by the end of the summer, he'd ask me, how many of them dollars you got that I gave you? I said, man, they gone, you know. And he said, now see, now, now that's how you understand how to make what you have stretch so you'll have what you need. And he'd give me another hundred or two or three or however much it was as I left to go back home. So. As I got older, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, I started to think, like, how can I make this money last me until Christmas? Because that's when I see him again, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so my mom, no, this is really in my head, like, how I process this as a 9, 10-year-old. So I take maybe $100 and go to Sam's warehouse, and you know what I'm saying? My grandmama would buy a bunch of candy. I started, you know, turning a little profit, making $20 a day, and, you know, and before you knew it, I had kids on other hallways selling candy for me. I was paying off teachers, a candy bar day, and, you know what I'm saying, that was like my introduction into, into entrepreneurship. So there is a sense, those of us who, who, who know your backstory, there is a sense of taking that from candy trade to drug trade. Yeah, I slowly transitioned into, <laughs> you know, you know the, the natural progression of things from <laughs> Snickers and Kit Kats is crack cocaine and marijuana. That's, you know, that's how life goes. I thought that's how Hershey started. <laughs> So talk to me about the idea of, of what we call underground commerce and trade in our community. And mm. we can laugh about it now, and you are a success story, 
But there is a sense of how many brothers that we lost with great business minds, sure. we hear these stories all the time, mm -hmm. that don't get snatched up, and, and not by cops, but by those of us in the community who say, look, bro, you're smart. Come on over here and, and, and make that legal. Did you have anybody in your life that was saying, I got a bright kid here, let me see what I can, tr tr let me see if I can try to sway him this way? Um, yes. Just none that didn't sell drugs, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my cousin, Tremel, uh, too, God bless his soul, he, 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 he was my cousin by my, grand, my grandfather and his grandmother were cousins. And he was, you know, maybe 10 years older than me. I was 16, no, maybe 18 years old um, on Camelton Road in Atlanta, southwest side of Atlanta. And, you know, distributing crack cocaine. I don't know another way to say it. Um, and I ran, into, I ran into two, and, you know, he said, hey, man, ain't you Tim? I said, yeah. And when I saw him, I knew him as, you know, kind of like, I say the plug, you know, he's the guy that you know what he does, but don't nobody talk to him about what he do, you know. <laughs> and so then he walks up and says, ain't you tip, da 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 And you know, all my other guys who, who I was out there on the block with, they looking like, what, what they talking about? You know what I'm saying? And he's basically saying, man, so you, you, you Quint nephew, right? And Quint was my uncle who was doing 10 years at the time. I said, yeah. He said, so you tree son, right? I said, yeah. And, uh, and then I say, so am I going to get to ask you some questions? <laughs> <laughs> so long story short, he was asking me, you know, because he heard that I rap. Uh, and rapping was something that I've always done since I was like 10 years old. Uh, and, and, you know, I had started doing demos, trying to get record deals. It didn't work, so I'm back out here on the block. So he's asking me about rapping. And I'm like, yeah, but like, why are you asking me about that? And so he's asking me if I knew a guy named DJ Toon. DJ Toomp was a childhood friend of his. And I say, no, I do not know DJ Toomp. I say, well, when am I going to get to ask you some questions? <laughs> and so, you know, at the end of the conversation, he said, okay, what you got to ask me? I say, man, put me on. And he say, man, hell no, I'm not going to do that. You know what I'm saying? So, so he began to take me under his wing and kind of show me um, a different side of life, if you will. The one thing he showed me was you know, how nobody knew what he did because he wasn't really trying to be flashy. He wasn't, mm -hmm. he drove a little uh, Honda Civic and he woke up early in the morning and he moved around and did his little thing and by the time rush hour traffic was done, he was done. Back home with his family cooking and, you know what I'm saying, trying to live as close to a normal life as possible. And he always had other businesses like, um, he was in the cosmetology somehow. So he had, you know, beauty shops and barber shops and, you know, he did little other, other things. And that was my first, that was the first time I saw a guy who came from where I, what I was doing, mm -hmm. who had kind of transitioned into another world. But I think his intention for me was, like I think when he pulled up on me, he's like, man, what the hell are you doing out here with the rest of these guys? Mm -hmm. And if this is what you are meant to be doing, then we need to get you to doing it. And he introduced me to DJ Toomp, and you know, the did rest you, is history. Did you see rap as an art form solely, or did you see that as a career and the idea of this is how I can make money? Well, at first, I just saw it as a way to let my older uncles let me stay in the room while they was talking grown-up talk. You know what I'm saying? You know, they'll call me in and say, hey, Tip, do that, do that thing, you know? <laughs> and so I kick a little rap and they'll laugh, oh man, he funny, he funny. So I could sit in there and watch Eddie Murphy Raw for a little while, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, but as, as, as the, the genre expanded, I then began to notice, the first thing I saw was that, you know, you don't have to be an adult to do this. You know what I'm saying? Like when the crisscross came out, and I found out they were discovered at a mall. I'm like, man, I was at the mall the other day. What, <laughs> what's going on? You know, so uh, that's when I think, you know, crisscross, ABC, 
another bad creation, if any of y'all, um, okay. So when they came out, you know what I'm saying, and I found out they were from Atlanta, and you know, they my age, and I, you know, I just, I, I began to tirelessly kind of pursue, I started asking my daddy for, for studio, for money for studio time, and started trying to find studios, and locate uh, uh, people to do production, and find talent show. That's when I actually saw it as an industry. So the popularity comes, the fame comes, you, you become a pioneer of trap music. All of these things start to happen. When do you understand that this is no longer just an art form, that you are now an entity within yourself? Because a lot of times when we think about athletes and entertainers, we don't necessarily always see them as business people. Mm -hmm. But once you start to kick to a, a certain level, sure. I'm not talking about a one-hit wonder, right. not talking about a dude in the NBA for you know a, a season and then he's cut. I'm talking about those like yourself who have talent, who parlay it. When do you start to understand this is a business? I am a commodity. Um, right around my second album. Well, you know, my first album, you know, it was just real fun. You know, I thought I thought I was going to have a real 50 cent year. You know what I'm saying? Like, I felt like, you know, there was nobody better than me. And my music was incredible. And I was on the same record label as Outkast and Goody Mob. And, you know, I was rubbing elbows with the people that I'd grown up listening to and that I admired. So I just really thought I was about to take off. So when that did not happen, you know, I had to kind of, as you just said, I had to take some of my old tactics and apply them with new efforts. And um, that's when I just kind of took to the street. Because one thing I did know is most of the people who was around at the time, like they wasn't really, how can I say, respectfully, a lot of them, you know, either they didn't have what I had talent-wise, or they didn't have what I had connection in the streets wise, you know what I'm saying? Like they couldn't go to places that I could go, they didn't know the people I knew. So I just started putting that together, you know, I would show up to the project, like the roughy part, and I'd be passing out my CD, and they'd be like, man, ain't nobody came in here. You know, what you doing in there? I'm like, man, here, I have my CD. So, you know, and, and, and that, I began known as the guy the little guy who wasn't scared to go nowhere. So talk to me about that, not, not the physical fear, but the idea it also takes bravery to just go and get out there. I want you to talk to those people out here who maybe are small business folks or trying to start, the idea of finding that within yourself to say, I've got to do this. Well, this is, I think, when my album, that is the, exactly the beginning of the story. When my album didn't work, I had to resort to different tactics and had to put you know, formulate a plan together because just because the face didn't see me as a priority did not mean that I didn't see me as a priority. So, <laughs> thank you. So I just basically took what I had, you know what I mean? I started making mixtapes and, you know, started just traveling a, a small circuit uh, from Atlanta to Birmingham, Montgomery, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, uh, Tallahassee, Jacksonville, and then if I got that little, I got that little circle down. I spread out a little bit. Okay, I can hit Memphis now. Now I can go to, I can go to uh, uh, Biloxi. I can go to New Orleans, and I, you know, and that I spread out a little more. Okay, well now I'm in Virginia, and now I'm okay. Well, and that is, like that, is is what caused me to get the buzz that I needed for LaFace to then call me and say, hey, uh, what we doing with this second album here? I say, second album? I ain't heard from y'all. <laughs> and, well, listen, LA really wants to meet you, wants you to come up and sit down and talk about things. Okay. So me and my manager at the time, my partner who started Grand Hustle with me, Jason Jeter, we go up to New York. You know, we sit in, you know, we sit in. By then, we had done a bunch of research. I done read some books. You know what I'm saying? I done talked to some people. And I know exactly what I'm going in here asking for. You know what I'm saying? So when I get So hold on, hold on. Let's not lose sight of that because I think sometimes we lose sight of that. It took a fall for you yeah. to understand I don't know enough 
about this business. Right. My second go round, right. I'm gonna know about what I need to know about. Well, that and I, I need the resources to fund my own movement rather than wait on another infrastructure, rather than wait on you to care enough to say, I'm going to invest my marketing department, my radio department, my uh, uh, PR department behind you. Uh, so I done research and you know, I, I learned you know, the different levels of, of, of participation as far as equity is concerned between an artist and a record label. So I go in there and he sits down and he talks to me. He said, man, I really love you know, the response, man. It just came out of nowhere, it just came you know, and people just started, I'm like, no, it was not out of nowhere. <laughs> there was some significant effort put into this. And, and, and my ba basically what I was, what, what my spiel was to him, okay, so since my album dropped, and it probably was about four to six months between the time it was released to the time he actually heard the buzz. So I was like, man, since my album dropped, you know, I have been tirelessly investing in myself and basically operating as an independent record label. So for me to move forward, there would be absolutely no way I would see it reasonable for me to operate as an independent label and not get the credit for being an independent label. I said, because if I was just waiting on y'all, you'd have never called mm -hmm. and I'd have never been here. So for me to work on the second album to ensure that it won't turn out the way the first one did, I'm gonna need $2 million in a joint venture. And he say, that's it? I say, yeah, that's it. And he say, oh, what? I say, oh, I mean, oh, you can just let me go. He said, okay. He said, I tell you what, let's have lunch. You know, let's have lunch. He didn't mean, he meant separately. He didn't mean to go. <laughs> <laughs> he meant, you go and get you something to eat. I'm going to stay here, dude. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk again after lunch. So I'm like, okay, all right, cool. So, you know what I'm saying? I went out, got me, a, me and Jay went and got us a couple slices of pizza. And you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, we came back about 30 minutes to an hour later, and we sitting in the um, in the waiting room, and uh, I'm looking at Jason. I'm like, man, it taking that long? Man, well, it don't take that long to say no. You know, we, mm -hmm. we good, so we in there. We like, man, we finna get $2 million. <laughs> and so then um, uh, I believe it was Mark Pitts who was with LA at the time, and Mark Pitts came out and said, all right guys, we ready. And then when he walking in, he say, man, you got what you wanted? I say, yeah. <laughs> so I get in there, I say, okay, what's up? And LA say, man, I'm gonna give you what you want. I'm gonna let you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, yeah. That's right. Let me go. So he turned me. He turned me loose. But see, you know what I'm saying. What I didn't understand then, he turned me loose in, 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 into the 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 into the industry, like with a buzz as a free agent. I already had a song going on the radio. I was already doing shows. So I went and got 2.5 from Atlantic and a JV. You know what I'm saying? So that, that was the beginning of me building my own label. And you know what I'm saying? I haven't looked back. But that's how I learned how, you know, own your masters and, you know, joint venture versus uh, P and Ds and, you know, all that. So let me take us to that spot where they say you got what you want. Mm -hmm. We're going to let you go. Yeah. Uh, we all have faced adversity. It's how you get up. We always talk about that. It's how you get up. There are people who don't get up. Mm. What do you tell these folks who may be facing that same kind of thing, that they either have to make a decision, that they're walking away from something, they're gonna launch and they don't ha have quite what they believe they have to have. How do you get up and say, all right, this is not the way I thought it was gonna go, but I'm gonna keep going? Man, you have to be relentless. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think you have, to, you have to be tireless in your efforts just to, to, to achieve the goals that you've set for yourself. 
Like there's a vision everybody has in their head. You know, how stubborn you are and how married you are to that vision will determine how far you are willing to take your action. You know what I mean? I just, I ain't never been ready to lay down. I'ma keep, I'm keep swinging, you know? As long as it's, as long as it's a, a air in my body, I'm gonna I'm continue to fight for whatever it is I feel I should have. Let's talk a little bit about um, diversification and you getting beyond music uh, in terms of business. Mm -hmm. A lot of entertainers, a lot of athletes have uh, d large amounts, large sums of disposable income after a while. Some of them kind of uh, wear the trappings. Uh, uh, but others decide that I'm going to enjoy myself but do other things. What brought you to diversification? And talk to us a little bit about the other businesses that you're involved with. Um, let's see. I think that my first other area of business was construction and real estate. And, you know, that was haphazard. My uncle who had, uh, he was like, you know, my, he was my father figure mentor who had been taken out of my life at eight, I say eight years old. And, you know, he had to, he got, he got a conspiracy charge for, for cocaine and ended up doing 10 years. So by the time I was 18, when I had just got, I was just getting a record deal, just got my first piece of money. He was just coming home. And um, I think I might've got a 60, 50, $60,000 check. And, and, and so when I saw him, he say, and I was bragging, I'm like, man, I just, I'm on, I just got, $50,000, and he say, okay, good, give me half. <laughs> like, what? Like, man, give me $25,000. Like, man, here. So I gave him $25,000, and I went on about my business, uh, spent the rest, you know, and, and, but luckily, because I was so hot, you know, I just continued to, uh, I continued to, to, to earn income. So I never looked back at the 25. So I think maybe six, six, about four, four, six months later, he um he rode with me through our old neighborhood and he pulled he pulled me up to a, a, a old house that I used to trap out of. Trap means uh, distribute cocaine. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> So he, he, he pointed to it, it was, I mean, it was, it, was, it was completely renovated and you know, it would look nothing like it did when I was there. And, and he say, that's us. I said, what you mean? He say, that's us, that's our, that's our house, that's what we did. I said, what? He said, man, that money you gave me, I bought this house for, what it was, I think he said $8,500. I put 15,000 into it with my own, I, I did it from what I learned in the penitentiary, and I, this is our house. And now, we can either put it up on Section 8 and get about $850 a month for it, we can sell it for $60,000, $75,000, and you know, and take the profit and put it into another one, or we could, and I say, let's sell it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we sold it and we bought two more houses and did the same thing with it and got some more and we ended up doing about 65 houses on, you know what I'm saying, in our own community. The other thing that, that as, as entrepreneurs and business people you face is failure. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about how you've dealt with that. You had a restaurant yeah. that ultimately closed. It tanked. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who's gone into that business understands that is a difficult business up front. Sure. Uh, give us a sense of how you deal with those kinds of things. Because if you and I were backstage talking. Uh -huh. There is a sense of if, you don't, if you're an entrepreneur but don't come with the trappings of a, a, a Wharton business degree or something, sometimes people will either underestimate you or mm -hmm. look at you and suggest Sure. You don't know what you're doing, yet restaurants fail all the time. Talk to me about how you've dealt with that. Well, I mean, for me, um, for me, I think that you have to either understand every part of the business or 
understand that you need to include someone who knows every part of the business. And the person that you include, you have to, you know, either have implicit trust mm -hmm. or, or you, you, you have to have a, a fail proof system, you know. And, you know, for me, I just knew, hey man, I can feel this, I can feel the restaurant up, you know what I'm saying? I can, I can get people in here as long right. as the food is good, as long as, you know what I'm saying, we, we, we can turn as many dollars as there needs to be turned for us to earn a profit. Uh, what I did not account for is the thievery. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, how many ways there is to steal money? I did not know, you know. I know you steal money from the dough. I know you steal money out of the cab register. I didn't know that you could take, like, you know, 10 straws out of pack over the course of a month and end up with, you know, $800. You know what I'm saying? I did not. I'm like... Then I just I I I, I underestimated that particular mm -hmm. industry, you know what I'm saying? But you know, luckily for me, the thing that I the thing that I always appreciate is you know, any industry I go into, it's it's secondary for me, you know. I, the things that I have done in my primary business have afforded me the ability to take risks, you know. Cause, yeah, because I always tell other artists and you know other people who I'm in business with, listen, I don't have to cheat you or steal from you. I, cause it ain't nothing that you can bring that I can't bring myself. I'm bringing Ti to the tape. I have a Ti, so I don't need to steal from you. You know what I'm saying? So, but see, everybody ain't got a Ti coming to the table. So, everything they making off of this particular venture is they 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 betting their whole house on it. We're gonna do some uh, quick q and I'm not gonna repeat what's been repeated. You know you will be shut down if you go on and on and on. So let's get ready to get some quick questions in. While we're lining them up, let me ask you something in relation to pitches. Okay. Because when you become TI and uh -huh. the bank is behind you, everybody's pitching you every second. Sure. Talk to me about how you would say, if you're going to approach it this way, this is what I need to hear. Not you specifically, but a good pitch. Mm. Well, I think that, well, first of all, this is a part of the question that you said. You said, when you become TI and the bank is behind. In other words, you got some cash. Yeah, because ain't no bank behind me. This is all, <laughs> you got, I'm you, self-funded. You, you got some pockets. <laughs> uh, no, nah, I mean, to be honest with you, what I think that, Anyone who's pitching anything should keep in mind is see it from the other person's perspective. You know what I'm saying? Like, one thing I think that, you know, when, when people pitch stuff to me, they only talk about what they're going to get, what they see it doing and how well it can go. They never talk about, okay, well, just in case I'm wrong, we can put these these, uh, uh, these measures in place that will protect your money and you will still receive your investment back over the course of these many days, weeks, or months. And as soon as you come and all you got, that's what my granddad used to call pie in the sky, you know what I'm saying? All you doing is talking about your wishes and dreams and aspirations. You can damn near see them doing this as they talking to you. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, I, I ain't, man, listen, you gonna have to go bust your ass and raise your own money for your own dream. I'm only here to earn some, some, some more money. Right, right. For that, more traffics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people have to understand your dream is your dream. Your it's dream not necessarily dream. my dream. That's real. Okay, yes. Hello. If only she could have a mic on. Testing, testing. Good morning, Tip. I'm from Atlanta. My name is Frida, and I'm one of the managing partners with Black Tech Charlotte. Right on. Thank you for telling you the truth about your story as far as Atlanta is concerned. Question is, what would it take if you're not already in the Black Tech industry or, or venturing into the Black Tech world? What would it take for you and other artists like yourself to enter into that world? And what are you looking for, especially in a place like Charlotte in FinTech? Well. I have been in black tech, as you call it. Uh, sure. Man, I was one of the first people in, you know what I'm saying, in technology. And technology is, 
another so area. So when you yeah. say in it, explain to her. Well, when I say in it, I mean I have been investing uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to no, with no return. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I am in it, you know. Uh, uh, but I, I think that I go with my good, I go with the, the, the need that I see within society and things that I see that are not yet existing. And, uh, and I try, when, tech, when, when in the world of tech, I try to invest more so in people. You know what I'm saying? If I meet you, you know, whether this idea is the idea or not, if I invest in you, I'm gonna invest in you. So, cause you know, one of the worst things we could do is invest in, if you have an idea today, and I invest in this idea today, and this idea does nothing, but then tomorrow you go meet him and that idea goes through the roof. You see what I'm saying? See, so I would rather invest in the person. So if I invest in you and your idea today, this idea and any idea for the next 10 years that you have will have to pass through here. You know what I'm saying? That's... All right, thank you. Yes. How you doing, T.I.? Um, I'm coming from Wilmington, Delaware. My name is Greg Wilby. Um, Wilmington's a big banking state. I'm on the board of a credit union that's for the underserved in the city. Our problem that we're having is to get the blacks or f underserved into the uh, banking. It's can okay to say black. Okay. And so <laughs> when, when you went banking, you they got the, co the compliance is crazy. <laughs> uh, how can we get more icons? To, the problem we have is that they don't want to get near banks for whatever reason, because of credit, or whatever. How can we get more icons be around banking and to understand financial? Uh, education. Okay, so your question is, how do you get more black people to trust the bank? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, free money? <laughs> uh, now nah, I don't know, man. I think that every, I think every, every, every person has to have their own relationship, man, with their own, you know, their own banking entity. Uh, I think that. The more, you, the more you allow small business loans, you know, the more you allow first home buyers the opportunity to uh, you know, afford their own homes for themselves, I think that that kind of instills, you have to be invested. Right. You know, how much do you want that relationship to work? You have to extend some form of an olive branch yourself. You can't just say, oh, we're the bank. You guys right. come, come, come deal with us. I think that, that, that you know, you have, there has to be some level of investment there. And, and, and the key is, thank you very much, sir. The, the key is, I think, what you've been talking about, and that's relationships, whether it's with a bank, whether it's sure. in the person you're investing in, whether sure. it, it really starts with a relationship, it if does. I like you or not. It does. Because if I don't like you, I'm not lending you any money. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. Yes. And you know what? I, I see you all cut the line, but there was a, a young man who was in line. I want him to come up as well. We're going to get his question. Hi. Right on, young my man. man. My Hi, man. Tip. My name is Kaya Tolliver. I am actually from Atlanta as well. Um, right you on. went to Douglas. I went to Farrell. Okay. So, um, what I, my question is to you is number one, what do you see yourself in the legal cannabis industry? And number two, I would like, <laughs> I'm actually co founder and CTO of a cannabis technology startup. And I would like some time to talk to you. Okay, uh, was you not here yesterday? You weren't here yesterday, were you? Okay, we can't give you a pic. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, no, no, no. I'm I know, not, you want to talk to him. I want to talk to him, talk to him right. later. But, right. listen, but listen, check it out. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, uh, do I see myself in the cannabis industry? Now, see. <laughs> This is something that, you know, <laughs> this is something like that I have, no, for real, I've, to, I've, I've tossed this around, right? Now, first of all, just legally, okay, I can't be in the legitimate cannabis business technically because I am a felon. Uh, but one of my felonies was possession with intent to distribute marijuana, so wouldn't that make me an expert? <laughs> You know, 
But this is technology. This is technology. Just the technology. I got it. But now I'm saying, like, you know, it's it, it's crazy how, you know, things can be illegal for some time and we can invest our lives, freedoms, and livelihoods for it. But once it becomes legitimate, we are completely blocked out of the business. Uh, I don't, I haven't thought my way around it yet, but you know, it's definitely been something I've been mulling over for quite some time. So could, let me ask you, you said it jokingly, but could you be involved where you could be and lend expertise by not necessarily means of ownership, but perhaps I bring you on as a consultant. Perhaps. <laughs> okay. Perhaps that could that could work. All right. Sure. <laughs> Young man, what's your name? How you doing, sir? Hello, Tia. My name is Chris. I was trying to see what advice would you give to a young person starting their business. To any person starting a business. A and young person starting a young person business. starting. And in a fact, business. and in fact, man, come on up here so you can shake his hand. Come on up. Man. <laughs> Young man is. Come on, man. Come, mean, on, come on. He threaded to the nines, too, man. You understand? Hurry up, go check. What's it. going on, sir? How you doing? All right. Nice to meet you, man. All right on. What's your name? Chris. Chris. All right. All right, cool. Now, what was your question now, Chris? <laughs> Thank you. That's right. I'm an old man. Let me sit back there. <laughs> what was your question? What advice would you give to a young person starting a business? And Chris, may I just say for the record, brother, you are very sharp today. Yes, sir. My man. Yes, sir. Uh, well, brother, I'm gonna tell you, there's a certain thing called uh, profit, and there's another thing called loss, okay? Okay, so you start with $10, all right? If you put $10 into anything that you want to do, if you get back those $10, then you've only made back your investment. However, if you tend to make $15 to $20, then you have made a $5 or $10 profit. Let's just call it $15. You, 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 your new business is not going to come that fast for you. So, let's, all right, so you, you, you start with $10, you invest in something, it makes $15, back into the company, you take the $5 and put it in a jar and you start over again. And as that jar gets taller, then you invest more money and then you, you're you going to need a bigger jar after so long. That's how, you know, that's, 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 the, that's basically the principle that any business operates under. Grow right. your money, man. Right on. Thank, Thank you, you for your man. question, sir. So look, man. We're up against it. So in closing, what do you want people to walk away with in terms of, because we were talking about image and the uh -huh. idea of making sure that people understand that we're all a work in progress, mm -hmm. right? You talk about that. In terms of business, mm -hmm. talk to us about you being the work in progress as a closing thought. Uh, I mean, I think we all are work in progress, no matter what level of life or business that we, that, we, that we operate under. I think life is a series of adjustments, and if you stop adjusting, then, you know, you start, you start dying. You know, you can either move with the times or be left behind. So for me, you know, it's about diversification, you know what I'm saying, continuing to learn, grow, and evolve. And, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe this young man might give me a job one day, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, 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 as far as my image goes, I think that anybody who has ever encountered me, man, you know, they know that I lead with respect. I'm going uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give people respect, the courtesy that they deserve. I don't care what you are, what you do, whether you're the CEO, the janitor, the driver, or whomever you are, I'm going to treat you the way that I would want to.